Hey folks, Matt Sharp here with another Pacific Angler Friday Fishing Report. Filming for August 11th. If it's nowhere near August 11th, click up here. This is a link to all the Friday Fishing Reports. We do it most weeks, so I should have something up to date for you. I said I'd tune in when the pinks arrived. Then I went on vacation and the pinks pretty much arrived during my vacation. We're going to talk about that because the reports have been mixed. There's been some success, there's fish around, uh, but there's some issues with the Squamish fishery in general when it comes to water clarity, as well as issues of just numbers. Now there's some good news there because the saltwater boats are having excellent, excellent pink fishing. And the test sets that I've been seeing are actually fairly positive. So we're gonna talk about that right off the hop in the beginning of the report of what to expect over the next coming weeks, because I do expect some really good opportunities to get out there and enjoy the fishery. Now, the second one we gotta talk about is closures. Yes, the vetter got closed due to snagging. It was quite ironic. I was driving down back from my vacation and I looked over the vetter river and there was no one fishing there. I went to visit a friend and he said, you see all the idiots snagging fish at the crossing? And I said, actually, I saw no one. And that was because it was closed. We're gonna talk about that a bit. I'll give you the short version of what I think about the whole thing, because a bunch of folks have tuned in and I do feel that they did a really good job of laying it out better than I can do. Uh, but basically, I think it's a knee jerk bad reaction by DFO to a even more troublesome situation that we as anglers should probably address among ourselves. And we're going to talk about that because I am concerned that what was done there might be looked at in as a management measure to deal with other issues in fisheries. And that's a concern for everyone who is playing by the rules, because when they blanket close because of a few bad apples, it poses problems. Now, with that closure front, we've also seen some funny ones. I keep getting calls about Ambleside. I keep getting calls about Indian Arm. I keep getting calls about areas even on the Squamish where there's either signs or people are coming out and saying you're not allowed to fish here. We're going to talk about that a bit because I've looked as hard as I can to try to figure out what the right way to go about it is. And a few of them are kind of blatantly wrong when it comes to what jurisdiction it is to say yes or no to fishing. We're going to talk about that in the middle of the report, and I promise not to rant too hard about it, but I do want to make sure that we always have opportunities to get out and enjoy these resources. And it does seem as though a lot of folks out there who don't understand fishing like to try to take it away. Now, doom and gloom aside, I want to talk about some good news, and the good news is the saltwater fishing has been excellent. There's more opportunities that opened up at the beginning of the month. We're going to go over where those slot limits are, where you can now retain Chinook even in the harbor in certain very specific areas. And we are going to look a little farther out because the pink fishing is phenomenal for the saltwater anglers out there. The coho fishing has been hard because there's so many pinks and there's quite a few Chinook around. And again, test sets and indicators that we're seeing might be telling the tale of a very good late season coming. And we can cross our fingers for that September 1 opening when there's a lot more opportunity to target Chinook around the lower mainland. Last but not least, we're going to talk a little bit about my trout trip. I took a week to travel around, hit a bunch of different rivers. It was excellent. We're going to talk about water temperatures. We're going to talk about just some general things that I saw while I was out there, as well as some cool gear that I really like that I tried new for this year. And you might want to throw in your own kit if you plan to get out doing some trout fishing. As always, you want to see more fishing reports like this, consider hitting the like button, hit the subscribe button. Let's get into it. All right, thanks for tuning in, everybody. Uh, cheers to uh, Friday in August. I hope everyone's having fun getting out there, enjoying it. Uh, we're going to start off with the pinks, because what have we been hearing? Well, they've arrived in the Squamish. They've arrived at the beaches, but it's very spotty. It's spotty when those fish are pushing into the beaches, and it's spotty to find areas on the Squamish where there's clear enough water to catch them reliably. I still recommend going, I recommend watching water levels. Right now the Mamquam, at least as I'm recording, is still pumping quite dirty water, which makes it very hard because those fish can't see your presentation and it leads to concerns of snagging. We have to be very careful in this fishery. If you're in a spot and you happen to snag one, maybe two fish, I really want you to think hard about changing your presentation or moving uh, because 
it'll be how the angles work of where you're standing for that fish to get snagged, be it with a fly or with gear, and moving can change that. It's going to be challenging if the water's dirty. We do need to see things clear up to see more consistent biting fish. But the good news is we think a lot more fish are coming. Now, they're very late. When you look at historical numbers, they should have been in the Squamish now in really good numbers. And usually that indicates a much smaller run. There's a lot of concerns about this run due to washed out gravel, ocean survivability. But I've seen some test sets that indicate that there might be a lot more fish still coming. Now, are those fish going to the Fraser? Probably. But hopefully some of those are also going to be pushing up house sound as well as Indian arm. So that's good news. We got our fingers crossed that the best of the pink fishing, at least up house sound area, amble side up Indian, is yet to come. And it is well worth getting out right now, whether it's on the beaches or on the rivers. Again, play by the rules and respect those snagging regulations. I would hate to see, for example, the Mamquam bar shut down if they saw... Uh, repeated snaggers like they did on the Vetter. Now, let's talk about the Vetter. I'm gonna pull up the map. A lot of people don't know yet and uh, have them scratching their heads and I'd hate for you to head out there and maybe uh, go to an area, where is it here? I had it open a second ago. Ah, uh, here we go. Uh, so yeah, I'll throw this up here so everyone can see it, but they've closed this area till the 30th of September. And I'm not getting into the details of who it was, why it was, what was going on, but the bottom line was they saw a effort by specific anglers to snag sockeye and it was happening repeatedly. They observed this and they said, hey, we're just gonna close down this whole area. Now, I think that's a really bad way to manage a resource, manage a resource that is a great part of our economy. Uh, but the bottom line is DFO just doesn't have the manpower to get out there and ticket. They've got something like six DFO working in a massive area to cover. And it, it's just not enough to go out and ticket regularly in a spot like this for relatively a low impact, meaning there's sockeye there that are very, very important, but would you rather have one of those DFO guys or girls find a gill net with 500 sockeye in it or a bunch of Chinook or a bunch of steelhead versus the handful that may get hurt or killed uh, due to snagging on the vetter? Now, they're both awful, but I understand the uh, resource allocation for DFO. Now, what I would love them to do is actually have done some public consultation, actually given the angling community a chance to say, hey, this has to stop within ourselves. So I'm going to do that again. We've done this before, but do not snag fish. Do not long line float and set the hook at the end of your drift. Do not use long leaders. Short float. Look for biting fish. If you do happen to snag a fish, because it does happen, consider changing what you're doing, whether it comes to your presentation, whether it comes to your depth, whether it comes to your angles. All of those things can play a big factor and get you back in the game of looking for fish that are actually biting, which is what we're legally required to do when out targeting. Now, you're going to run into this. I run into it all the time. I see this happening and it boils my blood. Don't let it ruin your day. Try to go up and educate them. Say, hey, you guys, you shouldn't be doing this. And this is why they're going to close the fishery for all of us. Do you want this fishery closed? Because that was the precedent that was set here. I don't like that, but maybe we can convert a few folks that maybe don't know any better. And again, treat all these interactions with the utmost respect and don't let it ruin your day of fishing. If it does get into a confrontation, just move on. It's not worth it. And I do recommend calling DFO, even though I don't like how DFO reacted to this individual situation. All right, uh, let's talk more about other closures, other ones that are weird and strange. First one is back to Ambleside. You saw me flipping through pictures there. Uh, we've got notified of this and I'd heard about it before, but this is Ambleside Park and there's a bunch of signs sort of lining the walkway that say no fishing. And that's really confusing for a new angler who wants to play by the rules. Uh, one thing we have to remember is that is a municipal park regulation. Uh, I've looked it up and they're right. There is no fishing on that park. And if you notice, there's a little pond in that park and you're not allowed to fish there. That is in their jurisdiction. Anywhere below the high water mark, however, is not. And we are allowed to fish there. Uh, DFO would have to make that closure and they haven't. And so if anyone gives you grief about fishing at Ambleside, as far as I read the law and as far as everyone that I've put this in front of, those signs do not affect beach anglers when it comes to fishing from there. There might be an argument 
for fishing from the rock jetties, where that could be something uh, that this regulation falls into. But the second you're below that high water mark, that mark of kelp, that uh, tide line on the rocks, then you are no longer within this park and no longer within that regulation. So note there. Now, the other one is I've heard some talk of up Indian Arm. Now, there's some closures up Indian Arm due to rockfish conservation areas, and you absolutely can't fish there. Uh, but I'm trying to figure out more about that. We haven't found anything from DFO on closures around the mouth of the Indian. If somebody knows more than me, send it my way. Taylor and I spent about two hours digging through regulations to see if something had changed. Uh, as far as I can tell, there is nothing up there. And if someone does get stopped and asked, please ask the person to explain it and show it to you because we can't find it. It makes no sense. Maybe it was a rockfish conservation area that you have to abide by and do check out the map and see where that is and where those markers are. Uh, but long story short, there shouldn't be any closures up there. Other closures, I'm not going to get into them in detail, but it seems like there's signs popping up everywhere. Uh, simple rule is that if you're below the high water mark, private property is not in effect, as well as any ownership of property. So play by the rules, be respectful to everyone out there. If someone says you're not supposed to be there, ask them to educate you, uh, make it a positive conversation. And if you're not sure after you come home, send me an email. I'd love to hear about it. We'll try to do some digging at our end because I do feel that we need to protect every opportunity and every area that we are allowed to go uh, fish because it seems like time and time again, they keep trying to close us, shut us down and box us out of fisheries that we've enjoyed for decades, if not longer. All right, let's talk about saltwater fishing because that's some good news. Really good news, actually. We've seen some phenomenal trips. Our boats have been going out every day and it's been darn good. I will say that there's so many pinks sort of off Bowen Point Atkinson pushing up into House Sound right now that the coho fishing has been challenging. And we think it's just a symptom of them getting pushed around by the mass of pinks. Coho fishing is still good and there are still lots of coho out there and it's well worth it, but do expect to run into some pinks when you're doing it. Now, the Chinook fishing, we've had an opening on the North Shore. I'll put the map up here. There's a sliver along the North Shore where you are allowed to retain a uh, slot limit Chinook. I'll put the details up here. And then across the strait, they've opened up a little bit more of an area around Thrasher Rock, where again, the slot limit is in effect. We still can't fish in the major areas around Vancouver Harbor, but when we've been out coho fishing and we've been out pink fishing, there have been quite a number of Chinook, which has been cool. Now we're not targeting those. We tend to move off if we're in a scenario where we hook one or two of them, but the indications are that we're going to see a good late Chinook season. We're also seeing some very large fish. We had not one, but two, but three Thai classed fish taped uh, for genetic work in the last handful of days, which was really fun to see. All those fish went back. And quite honestly, if you have the opportunity to put one of those fish back and it's not bleeding, uh, when we are allowed to retain them, I would still encourage you to do that just to keep those genetics going. All right, let's talk trout fishing. Uh, let's talk about my vacation a bit. I'm not going to go into detail of where we went. We traveled all over the place, hit a bunch of different fisheries. It was cool. Uh, I wanted to just talk a little bit generally about uh, what we're seeing on the trout fisheries. It's still well worth getting out. All the temperatures that I took were within norms, even though the water is very, very low on these systems. Still, as always, treat all the trout with respect. Make sure your barbs are pinched. Make sure things get back in the water quickly because it is warming up next week when we do look at the weather. I can pull that up for everybody right now if you're thinking about getting out anywhere. But uh, it looks as though in the 14-day trend, we are going to see above average temperatures. Now, we've seen fairly average temperatures for the last month, which has been great because water has been so low that if we saw big spikes in temperature, we might have some problems. Now, there's no rain in the forecast either, which I would like to see. We had a little bit over the weekend. Things were cool. That was good. Uh, so keep an eye on it. We're seeing like 28s in certain areas around the lower mainland, and that's just going to push warmer if you're heading farther into the interior trout fishing. But I, I did want to talk about it a bit because I, I, I love trout fishing this time of year and getting out. And there were a couple things that uh, I threw into the kit that uh, I really, really recommend. Now, I don't use waders this time of year, even though some of the tributaries that were on were quite chilly. Uh, I went with the wet wading boots and I threw in the wet wading sock with the wet wading boot this year. And I 
absolutely loved it. It made getting them on, getting them off way easier. So if you're heading out, if you've done the neoprene sock, it's way better than nothing. It's really, really nice actually. We've got those in stock, but try throwing the tight weave wet weighting sock underneath it. It was a game changer for me, at least by day five when I'd been wearing the same socks over and over again. Got a little gross, but that was just a fun one that I thought maybe you guys can add to your kit. The other one that uh, I've had for years, but uh, I'm gonna pump again, is this guy here. If you guys are a dry fly addict like me, you need to have some sort of a floatant. That's uh, sort of just to get in the game and you should be applying floatant right off the hop. But in that little kit there, I've got dry shake and gink. And so what do I do when I'm setting up for the day? I'm going to hit my fly with gink, not a ton, just in light greasing. And then if you're successful, if you're catching fish, you're gonna to need to revive that fly. And then depending on how dry the fly is or how saturated it is, I'm gonna use the dry shake uh, to dry it out. Uh, it's really helped me when say we're putting up good numbers you know five six fish on one fly instead of sticking it in your hat and having to dry it out and retiring a fly that's working you can usually get a handful more fish out of it if you sort of cycle back and forth between the gink and the dry shake so little pro tip there another thing uh is cover water uh it looks like on our skagit fisheries that the nymphing throughout the day is the best dry fly pushing more into the evenings which is normal uh, i'm going to be heading up there in september if temperatures stay the same and everything is good on that front uh, pushing more towards kettle thompson those areas it was cover ground cover ground big dry flies uh, look for areas of high oxygen because those rivers are usually warm and the fish need to live there. And last but not least, if you happen to be heading out to the Thompson, make sure you've got cleats in your boots. I bailed and fell flat on my face more than once. Uh, and uh, that's a river that I've been hiking for years. Uh, it's sort of a price of admission when it comes to that one. So pop in some fresh cleats if you haven't done it. It's a good excuse to get ready for salmon season if you've got Vibram and you want to get some extra grip there. All right, that's everything I've got for y'all. I uh, hope you can make it out over the last part of August. Uh, come down to the shop if you want to talk trout fishing. Heck, if you want to talk pink fishing, a bunch of the guys have been heading out regularly. Uh, we're hoping those waters are going to clear up. And if you are heading down to the shop, just a friendly reminder, we actually have some of the best parking that the shop has ever seen, but no one knows about it. You can park right out front of the shop. It is a loading zone specifically for our customers and it's free and it's open all day long. So there's no more worrying about getting towed when they do a traffic change. Uh, so we hope to catch you in the shop. And as always, you wanna see more reports like this, consider hitting the like button, hit the subscribe button. I'm gonna catch you in two to three weeks.